I bought these five hockey books, and I'm going to tell you everything that I don't like about them. Why would you buy something that you don't like? It's like, well, if we're to evolve hockey training, we have to look back at where it originally was and say why what we're presenting here is a lot better than what is in the textbooks of the past. So yes, this is not an endorsement of any of these books by their own means. I will say what I like in terms of what they do have and what obviously I don't like because that's the point of this specific video. But really, these were just five training books that I found in a store and I thought, well, why don't we go look at them all and compare that with what I'm presenting and see what has actually produced more or less results. One of the first ones we'll look at, Hockey Anatomy. Now, this is endorsement from Patrick Kane, Jonathan Tays too. So it's like this, uh, Paul Goodman or Michael Terry worked with both of these guys. And obviously, they're, they're, they're good players. They're good players. Like almost three Stanley Cups, and they were famous with the Blackhawks. It's like, they're not bad. They're not terrible. I don't think they were terrific athletes, considering that Kane had to get, what was it, hip resurfacing surgery recently, and Tays is out of the league. Um, albeit for different circumstances, but they, they know a little bit about this. And, but at the same time, are they guys like McDavid? Are they guys like McKinnon? Are they, you know, uh, these players who can, who have excelled the skating standards and speed standards of NHL players nowadays? They are not them. Even though Kaner and Taze are legends in their own way. It's like they're not the McDavid's and the McKinnon's. It's, and other players like that who are super fast. So basically what this book goes over is the anatomy of your body and how it relates to your hockey performance. And then it, get, it gives out some exercises. The thing that I'm going to disagree on is all the exercises. So we're going to look through most of them. One of the first ones I'm looking at is a single like isometric wall squat, which is like, I don't teach wall squats. And there's a good reason for that. It's because I do ATG squats through a full range and that develops the quads better than anything that is a plain isometric without additional weight actually. And yes, there are muscles involved in it. Yes, the, this exercise is demanding for the quadricep muscles, which are used in hockey. It's like, of course, like the quads are used in hockey because they develop as you train or play throughout your year they're one of the only muscles that literally hypertrophy throughout the season but as far as using that to train it that doesn't train it something that would be better for you is a full bend hg squat or a full bend hg split squat where you're going through a full range and you're developing the muscle through more length the better a muscle can go through range, and the more range that it goes through, the better it develops with less weight. So you can put on a HG split squat with less weight than you would with a 90 degree squat, and your quads would develop way more than with something like that. And I am living proof of exactly that. You can just look at my legs below, like right here. There are some exercises I like. I, I'm seeing the scanning good morning, which is like, yeah, that's good. I think that in combination with a seated good morning is okay. There's a Romanian deadlift in here, although it's a single leg RDL. There's a Nordic hamstring curl in here, although they don't use the machines. They just use person-to-person -person assistance. There's a, there's a box bridge, which is like a, a glute bridge, which is like, you can, you don't need glute bridges. You can do a back extension and be okay with it. You can do every single back extension. You can do every single hip hinge with the RDL, see you good morning, anything like that, standing good morning, any of the good mornings, any of the deadlifts, and you'll be okay. And you, you'll actually develop a lot quicker. And actually, some people have proven that as you get your back stronger, as you get the spinal rectus stronger, the glute bridge becomes a lot easier, whereas it does not produce the opposite effect. There's some other exercises in here that have upper body and lower body, uh, upper body pull and push, kettlebell squat and press, like this exercise, you don't need to combine the two of them. You might as well just separate your strength with the squat and the, and the strength with the press, and then overall, it, it, it executes the muscles a lot better and adaptation of strength a lot better. That's more of just a, a fun movement rather than something that's actually productive. Wave squat, it's like, eh, just do a full bend HG squat. Push press, there's some Olympic lifts in here which are like, yeah, there's a time and place for them. You shouldn't be doing them all the time, but they're, 
there's a time and place to go quicker. Depth jumps the box jump. That's good. Um, skating hops, it's like, it depends on how you do them. Do you want tension in your body to develop the muscles? Well, you might as well just do a regular squat in that case. I think for players to get a proper simulation of what on ice feel is comparably speaking to, to, to this, they need to understand how the human body moves and how moving out here is different than moving on ground. And therefore something like a stiff leg, like skating jump where you're just keeping your body still, like that doesn't work in my opinion. There's some other plow push ups, things like that. Some agility stuff, which is like, I, I just get on a sled. You don't need to do anything that's complex like this. Just get on a sled and go from slow to fast with it. There's a time and place for basic plyometrics, but you don't need you, you don't need to like jump around and all these like different things. They're more just for fun. Mobility, like there's a few things in here. Wall ankle flexion. Just do some tib raises. Do a seated calf. Do a standing calf. Do all the calf raises to, to open it up. Do an HG split squat. Like you don't need this. Knee grab. Okay, this is for the hip flexors primarily. It's like it's gonna activate that. Just do an HG split squat because it basically does the same thing as this, except statistically and measurably adapts your, 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 your muscles and your connective tissues a lot better than just a simple knee grab like, like this. You don't need to do knee grabs anymore. Actually, I don't do any of these like mobility drills, which are just more like, ah, oh, you're just moving through it. That's not mobility. That's just moving your body. That's not the same thing. The, the mobility can be developed. Mobility should not be an expression of what you can currently do. Mobility should be something that can be developed and trained. And you don't train it just by doing, oh, I can move my shoulder this way and 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 this way. And this way. Like, no, put a weight on it and like do, I don't know, some external rotations. Do a pullover where you're stretching the everything in your back. Do a, 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 do a bridge for all I care, like a full, a full fledged like body bridge. I need skiff. Like these are all just warm ups. It's like, you don't need these balance. Oh, 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 okay. Now, now we have something that is like, why does this even exist? Stick handling on a bozu ball. Like, okay, this is more for fun. It's not for training. There's a difference. And what I'm getting at is that if you're trying to go after standards, if you're trying to go after stick handling standards, if you're trying to go after shooting standards, if you're trying to go after, I don't know, anything like that, that gets you measurably better, Doing a balance drill like this on a, uh, a balancing device like a Bose ball is not going to get you statistically better. There's no measurements right here. That's the thing. It's just like you're on a Bose ball and you're stick handling and it's the, the exercise is like balance for a minute or so and see if you fall off or not. That's like, what's the measurement with that, that you fall off or don't fall off? It's like, how does that get you from 50 miles an hour on your shot to 70 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour on your shot? Like answer me that. Like how does that how does that happen? How does it get you a quicker stick handling cadence? How does it get you better at skating? Like why is that in a hockey book like this? Like you don't you don't need that. It's like next two actually. Next two actually. Coaching hockey in small area games and hockey plays and strategies. These are more of positional plays and how they translate to real games, which is like, I don't know. Like the benefits of small area games, it's like, okay. This one specifically goes over that and has strategies for uh, the offensive zone, four checks, back checks, ways to set things up, and just different steals and takeaways and small area games, which is like, yeah, I, I've done a lot of this with my teams, and it's like, I don't know the actual literature behind that and if it actually translates, but teams do it all the time. I think you're better off just playing five on five and like in my opinion as far as like an actual gameplay however if you want to isolate smaller area play you could very well do that but at this as like a test in a way for your your on ice mechanics and, and things like that like i really like keep away british bulldogs another good one for for training um like oh they call it neutral zone chaos but it's like basically everyone has a puck and then the last person to not have the puck knocked out of the zone is is the winner like that's a good game and like keep away is yeah keep away is in here also that's a i think that's good because it teaches you control the puck and reaction to any obstacle like that that's okay but again like to talk about the obstacle stuff you 
you could just train yourself around obstacles. But at the same time, like you want to go against other humans. So I think there's a time and place for a book like this. I would hope that more, more of it actually gets studied too by, by actual literature. Hockey plays and strategies, it's kind of like, okay, I have some things to say about this. It's like, there's 250 plays in here at the very least. And it's like, there, there's some coaches like Willie Desjardins who's like forwarded in this is like, okay, well, you didn't stay in the league for very long. So it's like, what the hell do you know? <laughs> like this goes over four checks and back checks and positional play face off offensive zone entries, things like that. It's like, here's basically my biggest takeaway from a book like this. It says, it's like, I'm sure that anyone can draw out a play like I am right here, just sitting down on a whiteboard and I could be like, Oh, just put the play right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. And also watch video. It's like, Oh, just go right here, right here, right here, right here. It's like, Yes, you should be using video to identify plays like that. But at the same time, I really question how much of these plays are actually predicted and actually happen. Now, some of them actually do because like, well, they practice the breakouts all the time and then they have like options A, B, C, and D and even more, more so than that. And admittedly, it is out of my scope of expertise. But at the same time, there's a reason that I focus on the individual is because there's a lot of noise in here. 250 plays? Like, are you fucking kidding me? You don't need that much to, like, be a good player. You just need to get good at your mechanics, and then the plays will come secondary. It's like, okay. I think I'm going to keep that book because it's useful for me to understand something that is technically out of my scope of practice, but at the same time, it's kind of like, master your fucking movements first and then get into the plays because the movements make the plays easier. If you cannot move on the ice, if you cannot execute a, a shot, if you cannot execute a stick handle or a deke, what's the point of executing like a thousand different plays that anybody can draw up when they're just sitting down and not actually working on the movements themselves so they don't know the kinesthetic awareness with, with how you know players are, are moving. And... Okay, next book, Power Skating. Laura Stam. Uh, clearly, I don't use this. It's like, this is a book that's basically 20 years old at this point. 1982, 1989, 2001, and 2010. It's like, hasn't been updated in 12 years as far as this recording. It's like, what's the first bookmark that I have? It's like, placing the skates. It's like, yeah, whatever. The skates that we have today are made of carbon fiber and not leather and plastic anymore, or whatever else they were made of. You know, the skates and body coordinates to produce curves and stuff like that. Yeah, they... they the arcs on the ice, like, I agree with that. Balance for stability and speed. It's like, what is this falling drill? Why would you do that? Like, what, what is this? Falling, falling, like, what? Why is this in here? Gliding in a wide stance on the inside edges. Yeah, here, there's a corkscrew position, and you often see a wide stance in the best players. The only difference here is that the, this, this guy's ankles are very stiff, whereas you see every other best player in the game, or best skater in the game, collapse in their ankles and having a separation between the ankle and the shin where it's inverted instead of everted like what you have with this demonstrator here who's clearly hasn't played in the NHL. Uh, stretching and coordination and hopping and warming things up. It's like, well, why would you even ha have to do this? If you're just going to hop, like, look, here's the thing. If you want to do an actual warm up, go on a, go on a sled and then do your skating. Like that, you don't need to do these different hops that, like, why would you have to hop on the ice? There's, there's no common situation where you're, where you're going to do that. Crossovers, as they call it, the push is out at 45 degrees. It was like, I don't know about that. You don't need these precise angles to like, get into like, force applied and different things like that. Oh, the V start, the diamond start. Ooh, where it's like, hey, you're just going to stay on your toes the whole time and not worry about the, the, the way that your ankle collapses and then glides into the ice. Like... No, that doesn't happen. Look, look at all these still imaging, by the way. That's a lot of still imaging. Here's the recovery. Ah, arm swing. Look at this. Some skaters believe that swinging the arms vigorously makes them faster. Wrong. Speed in skating comes primarily from the legs. The arms provide rhythm and momentum. Although the arms do increase speed when used correctly, they're not the source of speed. Yeah, they're not the primary source, but these guys swing it out to the sides and you're teaching it to swing it forwards. Like, excessive churning of the arms is, is a waste. Like, well... What does McDavid do? What does McKinnon do? Like when they're striding and if they even stride at all, it's like, I don't know. They, they, they do it a lot. And basically this, this stems from the, the concept that the upper body and lower body are separated. And it's like, no, actually your opposing shoulder and hip are connected across like an X. 
So train 2.0 refers to it as an inner spring. So if I turn this way and then relax myself, I would end up bouncing back this way. It's not this being separated. And then like if I, if I showed it on the ice, actually, if I turn this way, the lower body would follow if I didn't keep it like locked into the ice. Because again, we're on a slippery surface, so it, like you're able to see that. If I twisted my shoulders, then the lower body would follow. If this chair actually moved, th th you'd be able to see it too. There's a reason that if I go like this, there's a stretch across the back of my lats and the posterior sling and every one of those other muscles is because you're trying to get back to center right here. And like the fact that they're separated, no, they're not separate. It's just a, just a coiling and coordination of upper body and lower body, but that's how they go together. There's an inner like spring as what is commonly taught. Oh, look at these. Like you're pushing out to the side. It's just like the states and things move like this. They go like that. It's like, that's what happens when you're analyzing something from static imaging and you don't actually execute yourself and you don't try to copy what the best players are doing. That's where a lot of this evidence comes from. It's like, it's from interpretation. It isn't from actually doing it and mimicking yourself next to someone who's better at doing it than you are. It's like, I, I think the only reason Laura Stam got popular with this is because she's a name and not actually someone who worked on this. Like Luke Robitaille, I don't remember as someone who is someone as fast or maybe he got faster a little bit. I have no idea. Maybe he felt better on his skates, which is like, obviously that's a starting point. But balance is lost when a skater leans and tilts the upper body into the curve of the circle. Oh, well, that's what McDavid does. He literally leans into the, the middle, like, and he doesn't seem to lose balance or fall over. Like, explain that. Ah, forward front starts. Like, you're on your toes the whole time. It's like. Well, these guys are on their heels, and then they rock her towards the toe. They're not on the toe all the time. Otherwise, they wouldn't be gliding because that's the physics of a skate blade. It's like, ah. Uh. Anyway, here's some more strides and, like, uh, push starts, toes against the board. It's like, oh, whatever. I don't, I don't even know. But that's what I took away from this is because it's like, fundamentally, what is in here is not based off the scientific method. It's not based off rigorous testing and then falsifying. There's nothing in here that is like falsifying. And then the arm swing is a big example of that. It's like, the, the arm should be moving this way. Okay, what's your evidence for it? Besides static imaging in booklets like this, where you're not using the best players in the planet, you're using models that you paid for to be in the book. And I, I can say that because there's no Connor McDavid. There's no Sidney Crosby. There's no Nathan McKinnon in here. There's, I don't know who this guy is. It's like, not a good book. All right, last one. Complete conditioning for hockey. And this is by a director of sports performance for the Calgary Flames. And this one is like, uh, very interesting. So first off, it goes over the physical demands of hockey and then details out different energy systems and different tests and assessments and different exercises in addition to what the hockey anatomy book provided as well. It's like, here's the thing that I agree with. Like, the demands of the game are intense. There's no question about that. And then he details out exactly like the anaerobic capacity, the anaerobic peak power that has statistically increased since 1989 in all these players, even if their, their body weights have stayed similar, their height has stayed similar, and their body fat composition has actually stayed similar. Um, they're, the only difference that has like increased is the anaerobic peak power, which is like, yeah, that's kind of just a fancy way of saying players have gotten stronger and have gotten more more endurance. The case for an individualized approach. Position and gender influence many variables when designing and implementing hockey players' training programs. However, these demographics should only serve as a starting point in the program. Since hockey players are senior, reasonably homogeneous, all athletes present with their own specific requirements to achieve their best physical performances. I agree with that. I, I really like um, individualized training and, and programming and I think that's actually how you make the best results is because you, you work on the stuff that you suck at and then you make it so that you don't suck at them. And then that is actually where you make the most progress. It's not by copying like uh, a conventional program that you see like, hey, this is how you skate like this player or, or shoot like this player in, in 30 days or so. It's like, no, you can shoot like them by working on the technique that you, you're not good at or the shot style that you're not good at. And you'll actually end up being closer to how they shoot. Here's some assessments. Uh, there's a beep test, which I actually like. That's a great test for VO2 max. Anaerobic work capacity, like a five minute 
bike test, uh, 10 second wing gate test, like that's that's okay. Um, front plank test, like white, white side plank, you don't need these. Pull up assessments, I like that. Uh, squat jump, like that's fine. Ah, here we go back to the hip flexor. I, I have a huge opinion on the hip flexors, as if you couldn't tell, because like, well, that was the area that I hurt. Half kneeling hip flexor static stretch and then supine assisted hip flexor stretch. Just do a fucking ATG split squat. That will fix all of your problems and get, uh, sorry, get really good at the HG split spot and that will fix all your problems. Like don't do the, like these static stretching things that maybe work in the short term, but definitely don't sustain things for the long term. The, the issue, the, the reason that the HG split spot is not in here is because there's no studies done on it, even though there is in-house evidence, like countless times that it actually works. Ben Patrick being the most popular example of this. And most well-known example of this where he just mastered the absolute crap out of it not to mention you can go back to charles poliquin's work and he did this split squat all the time and fix people like very evidently and that's actually what atg is based off of there is some programming in here it goes in the meso and macro and mazino or whatever i don't know what you even call it because i don't uh program it with those terms i do structural balance then accumulation then intensification and then do that in like ones or twos or threes so example could be structural balance would be to start accumulation one, intensification one, and accumulation two, intensification two, accumulation three, intensification three. It's just different words of basically the same programming system. I just don't like using a bunch of M's when I could just go off of accumulation or intensification. It's like eh, maybe it's three syllables instead of four or whatever. I don't know. But I remember it better when I do structural balance, accumulation and intensification instead of just meso macro and I, I don't even know what the other ones are. Does modality matter? I often hear that hockey players should not ride the stationary bike in the off season. The rationale behind this is that hockey players should be completing their energy systems training in an upright position, such as when running. An upright position is said to counteract the short and tight flexors required from skating and cycling. There's some validity to that argument. However, I do not believe that hip flexion muscular factors are one of the benefits provided that the movement capacity plan is appropriate. What? Like, why is... I, I marked this down because I have no idea what this means. Because it's like, are you talking about cycling or, or doing more running or, or things like that? I actually like the sled a lot better because the sled doesn't tighten up your hips. Because you can, like, jump through it as if you were running, but you're also having a resistance similar to what the sled would provide. It's like, the, the bike, for me, just tightened up my hips way too much. At the same time, hip flexors, well, if you get really strong on the reverse squat or any other part of your hip flexor, like that is statistically correlated with skating speed because if you test out elite sprinters on, on their hip flexor strength, they are actually already strong in that specific exercise because they can lift 50% of their body weight if they're elite sprinters. And if they're not, they don't lift that much with it. So hip flexor strength is definitely correlated with something. And I don't know, I, I would disagree that movement, that hip flexor is, is more appropriate because you're not fucking testing it. It's like, you're not testing the, the speed with it and, and things like that. So it's like, whereas like I actually have, as I got my hip flexor stronger, I have sprinted faster, even though that is not the primary driver. The primary driver is posterior chain, which is hamstrings and low back. But at the same time, if you don't have those hip flexors structurally balanced, like it's not, it's not going to go along very well. And sometimes the hip flexor is the weak link for people anyway. So it's like you get your hip flexor stronger, AKA getting your weak link stronger, you're going to end up being a lot faster. Here's some more tests. So a body weight squat, it's like, okay, you're not testing astrograph squats, which means that you have no idea what this is. There's some split squats that are half range, a squat again, that's partial range, uh, Gloop bridge, art, single leg RDL. It's just like, can, can, why don't you just do a double leg RDL? Trap bar deadlift, like that's okay. Like I don't do it all the time, but that's like a good test. Nordic hamstring curl, it's like, yeah, you can use it with a partner, but why don't you just use it with the actual equipment design for it? That way you can do it like Marty St. Louis does. Upward, lower body, push and pull. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Uh, different rows, yeah, that's okay. Skating, like whatever. Adding complexity, adding an even weight distribution by using single arm loading or water bag loading, increasing velocity and adding torsion force to your, to your body. Like, 
Why would you add complexity and move away from something simple when simplicity and boring have gotten better results than complexity? It's like people are so distracted nowadays. It's like it's it's ridiculous. Why don't you just get really fucking good at the basics and then go from there? Like that's exactly how I adapted as well as I have. When training for power development, the focus must be on quality and execution of movements. Power exercises are usually high velocity skills that are technically demanding. Yeah, they're they're strenuous on the nervous system. I agree with that. And they go over some plyos, it's like, yeah, whatever, box jump. I don't like the box jump as much. I think a depth jump is more better for development. I don't think you need these skater jumps. I, I think you just you can literally just do jump balance from HG and be okay. Yeah, there's different progressions. Stop, drop jump. Yeah, that's in here. I like the, I like that. Jumps with weights, which is like, yeah, you can do some of these, but these are kind of too complex. Cable chops, like, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of these. Medicine ball throws, like you can actually be okay with those. Uh, they're, they're good plyometrics for the upper body. Oh cool, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I actually agree with that in a way. You don't need to rush movements. You actually make better progress by concentrating the quality of movements instead of rushing through it. Like yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Oh, there's some stuff that's on ice. Linear board stride, it's like, uh, that's not how these guys are skating. Reactivity stuff, it's like, uh, okay. I, I don't know what that if it actually changes anything. Wearable devices is like yeah you don't really need those. Okay, your training plan and program development. Here is where I have actually a lot to say because if we get into the specifics of how these sample programs are laid out, I'm gonna jump to the off season training. I want to go through actually the advanced ones and kind of read them out. I, I don't know. I'm not a fan of how these are set up. Let's just go through a workout. So. Table 3.4, sample phase one, three-day beginner and intermediate off-season preparatory phase, power and strength program. Goblet squat, two by 15, push-up, two by 10 to 12, front plank, not available. Uh, front plank, half kneeling, hip flexor, AIS, like what? Okay, goblet squat is okay as long as you're going all the way down. Push-up, just do presses. Front plank, you don't need that because you can just do hip flexor lifts and be fine. Half kneeling, hip flexor, AI, yeah, yeah, I don't know even know what that is, but just do a hip flexor raise if you're doing it like that. I wouldn't even program it this way. Like, it seems like it's an upper and lower kind of thing. RDL, rings row, side plank. Uh, you don't need a side plank. Chrome quad, quadriceps, AIS, like what is that? Shoulder external rotation. I don't even know what any of these are. But I, I think one of the biggest things that I noticed throughout all of this the, the reps are pretty pretty low, especially even in the off-season stuff and even in the advanced stuff. The sets never go above three sets. I don't think that's productive because, again, you can just focus on things that are most bang for your buck and get the most results out of them, providing there's a little bit of variety. But I, I, I have programmed before seven sets of three on uh, ATG squat before and then done some some accessories in here which speaking of accessories there's no calf work in here okay if you're talking about the increase in like achilles injuries in the off season by the way which is like you're getting fucking off season injuries first off that should never happen i i want to stress that point if you get an off season injury of any type for and for hockey players more and more commonly and it's, it's starting to become way too common actually achilles injuries in the off season because you don't work on your calves in season or off season and therefore like you're working too much up here and in your top of your legs and then your lower legs can't even handle it but and then you say oh i do plyometrics and that helps out the calves no it doesn't because you then do a jump and then pop your achilles blows out because it doesn't handle the weight of your like legs and your upper body that you develop more so it's like do you use the calves in hockey it's like wrong question the correct question is are you structurally balanced like the fact that calf work is not in here when this is an nhl level like performance coach is beyond me i have to stress that because there's so many fucking off-season achilles injuries like again off-season injuries of any type should not happen that should the only time that you even get an injury is when it's like a contact thing in the middle of the season and even then it's like you can prevent like even minor contact injuries like 
I, I think I think that's one of the bigger takeaways here is because it's like some of this have has exercises that are easily replaceable by exercises that are actually more measurable. So like I don't do planks. You don't need to uh, of any type because you just get strong on your your hip flexors and your low back and your QL side bends like. You get, and you can get measurably stronger at them because there's weights and you can actually track the weights increasing and things like that. You can also track the progressions on your plyometrics by looking at the vertical, which like you could do in here. I noticed, I, unless I missed it, there was nothing about tracking measurables in here or looking at numbers or standards to go after, which is like, okay, that is why, that's exactly why I talk about like the standards so because... We have to dissect what these best players or best athletes in the world are really good at. And then we need to adapt it for ourselves. So if, uh, again, going back to the concept that elite sprinters are already strong in that reverse squat exercise, if you want to get strong and good at sprinting, increase the size of your hip flexors. In addition to increasing the strength of your posterior chain. But as a weak link and structural integrity, perspective you want the hip flexors to match the posterior chain and by the way i was talking with a bunch of my trainer friends about some of the programming that's in there and saying that it's from this nhl coach and they were saying like yeah nhl is actually very far behind nba and nfl if it really is the case that nba is ahead of the nhl that's fucking embarrassing because I know so many hockey players, bad nothing basketball players, should be, oh, your wusses, get up. Like, you're stuck on the floor. Oh, you got a calf cramp? Like, oh my God. Like, I actually, like, had a massive skate cut or things like that. Like, why are you comparing that? Like, your, your body integrity is absolute garbage, and you're running yourself into the fucking ground. And, you, and you're like, oh, I can just push through it. No, you can't. Because, like, you're, you end up hurting yourself even more, and then your career gets cut short because it's like, oh, I, I, my hip gave out on me. It's like, you pushed it too fucking far. That is why that is why you ended it. It wasn't that your hip was the problem. It's because you didn't fucking take care of it. You, you got you to gotta fix that. That is, why, so, that is why that comment came up. It was like, the NFL and the NBA are miles ahead in training compared to the NHL. It's like... That shouldn't happen. It, it, with how much we talk about how the NHL's uh, athletes are way better than any other athlete on the planet, that should not be the case. And it is. It's like, what are you doing? It's, a, it's, a, it's beyond me. Anyway, enough of that specific rant. That was five books that I just wanted to absolutely dump on. And, well, I guess it did to a degree. There's some of them that I'm going to keep and some of them that I'm not going to, like, look back on you know very fondly and i think we're kind of useless but aside from again going back to the concept that it's like i i showed a little bit of what is better and if you look at my content throughout everything that i posted you know what i've been preaching you know what i talk about and you know why i think what i teach is already better but i do think it's productive to look at what to look at where things came from which is how we can evolve it to the next level Oh, I thank you for watching. I'm going to go head out there next, and I will see you next time.